that's it. I enjoyed very much being with everybody and uh, experiencing what you have to offer in your in your wonderful group uh, Zoom meeting. I think it's just phenomenal that uh, somehow or another you broke down barriers. So everyone who is uh, addicted in some manner are welcome in this in this workshop. And uh, uh, you know, it just really speaks to the unity of the heart. Uh, the language of the heart, and uh, I was just uh, been so pleased to be a part of that for this little while. So, uh, friends, uh, I, I I just want to say good afternoon or good evening, depending where you are, and uh, good morning if you're on the West Coast. And uh, let me just briefly introduce myself. Uh, I'm John. Uh, I'm an alcoholic and been sober for over fifty years. So. I uh, have a strong sense of uh, of spiritual uh, recovery. I started two meditation groups in my area and been meditating for over 25 years. And I think it's an invaluable tool for many things, including emotional sobriety. So uh, when I was about 25 years sober, I, I wasn't... Uh, practicing meditation. So it took me a while, I'm a little thick in the head. And so I kind of realized that, you know what? Uh, I had an incident that showed me where my emotional sobriety actually was. And just to give you a generalized idea of that, I, can't, I had to have a very difficult business decision that was overwhelming. And the fear that I thought I had conquered returned very quickly. And I would equate it to this way to me. That was like a cold heart squashing my, or a cold hand squashing my heart. It was, uh, I was frozen. I couldn't make a decision. I was just, just like a deer in the headlights. What I learned out of that experience is oh, I, I was living in an illusion of comfort and that I haven't progressed emotionally as, thought, as much as I thought I had which led me to start doing some things that I, I had never done before. And that was to reach out and do some research on, on things like emotional and cognitive uh, regulation. And this is what's important here. How you define the, diff the problem or the challenge will give a lot of bearing to which direction you're heading. So if you define this as a spiritual malady, you would go in the direction of prayer and meditation and and that's beautiful. That's wonderful. I'm not suggesting that that's wrong or anything. I participated in that, and I still continue to participate in that. I have this, this emotional dysregulation as a skill set, a competency. And what I did, or what I'm about to learn as much as I possibly can, what was known in the world that I had no, I had no idea was there. What contributes? to emotional regulation or emotional sobriety. And I come across a series of, of, of studies that are done that really intrigued me because it really spoke to my heart that I could actually build skill sets that will help me in developing my emotional sobriety and the way in which I think. And I, what I've done uh, over the years, I've created a community, uh, not to replace 12 step at all, but that, to be an addition to it. This community is called Freedom Hour. And I offer coaching uh, courses and a community. And Freedom Hour is based on this idea that there are evidence-based practices out there that will enhance my well-being and also allow me to flourish. Now, I'm 75 years old. I wake up in the morning and I have a lot of energy. I'm so interested in what's going on in the world. I, I just can't wait to get my hands on the work that I'm doing because I'm just, I'm just so full fulfilled when I'm doing that. I couldn't imagine being 75 years old and having that experience, but I have a great zest and enthusiasm for learning. And I still have it to this day. So as I began to pull together these studies and so on, what I came up with was, was seven master classes. And I'd like you to think of these master classes as spokes in a wheel. So there, let me just see if I can share my screen. And you'll see this, this wheel here, I hope. 
And this is what I believe contributes to emotional uh, sobriety. Uh, they are skill sets, they're competencies that can be learned by any individual. So the path that I'm trying to get on was already created and well formed. What I was trying to do was do this on my own. I'm trying to figure it out. Uh, not that any of you would ever appear to be that way, but that, that's what I was doing. And I was talking to people who didn't really know more than I did about what does it mean to regulate one's emotions and, and uh, correct our, our, the thinking uh, that had me involved into poor decision making. So this is what I come up and this is what I practice every day. This is what I teach. Uh, uh, evidence-based skill sets. I, I want you to get it. So it's not like I'm, I'm, I'm opposing the spiritual life. I have it this way, that God is causing me and I'm responsible for the doing. God is causing me to share this message with you because I think it's important that every addict in the world be introduced to these ideas. Why? Because we suffer so much internally the conflicts, the battles, the, the worry about, I'm not good enough here. I'm not smart enough. I'm not pretty or handsome enough. I'm not educated enough. Uh, there's something wrong with me. Basically, I am not enough. And I've talked to, I couldn't tell you how many people related to addiction. And I'll tell you, that's a prevalent thought. And oddly enough, it doesn't leave the person after they put down their physical addictive substance. That thinking stays with us. I just want to point to what the Dr. Silk was said, that we're restless, irritable, and discontented, and we seek comfort and ease. The comfort and ease in which I unconsciously chosen was alcohol. But look at the sequence of events that happened. First, I was restless, irritable, and discontent. And then I saw ease. Alcohol didn't cause me to feel restless, irritable, discontent. It was a result of that. So when I stop drinking, what's left is restlessness, irritability, and discontent. Now I want to turn your focus to page 23 of the big book. It talks about this very, very important thing, I think, that the main problem for the alcoholic, or put whatever addiction is there, the main problem centers in his or her minds. Now, I want you to grasp that for a moment. It talks about this idea that, wait a minute, my thinking needs to be corrected. It needs to be trained. It needs to be developed. Because up to this point in 25 years of sobriety, I was a slave to my thoughts. If I had thought, like for instance, uh, oh, I don't know, any number of thoughts, I would just automatic and robotically go and do it. There was no discernment there in terms of the quality of the thinking that I just went ahead and did what I was thinking in the moment. Now, this is very dangerous. It's also called impulsive thinking, uh, very impulsive. And it's caused me a lot of grief and a lot of anxiety. Now, when we're dealing with our thinking, and if we're critical and negative, there's a whole host of consequences that go along with that. That every day uh, I think about a problem or a difficulty I have, or what's wrong here, and, and I start developing that whole philosophy was playing out in my day-to-day -day living. And you can imagine the quality of life that represents. So what is the opposing thought? Well, the opposing thought I find is in these seven spokes in this wheel. First one is self-acceptance. The ability to learn how to accept oneself as they are and as they're not in the present circumstances now. Not when some condition happens like, oh, when I get over that or when I have more money or when I have a, a marriage, or when I get out of a marriage. You know, it's, it's, it's none of those conditions exist. The practice of self-acceptance is critical and important. And it's not enough to say that I'm practicing self-acceptance. You see, self-acceptance is an outcome of a series of skill sets that's required 
to have the outcome of self-acceptance. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, we put a lot of labels on ourselves. You know, we go back in our history and our past, and we have what, what I would call a me story, a fictional narrative of my life, where it's based sometimes in fact and sometimes in story. So I'll give you an example of what I'm saying to you. I don't want to get too deep in this, but I can spend the whole hour talking about this wheel. So when I was going to high school, I asked a girl out, and she said no. The fact is, this one girl said no to me. That's the fact. I made it mean that I am not dateable. I'm not good looking enough. That girls don't like me. That is the story I put to the fact. And what happened was I collapsed the story and the fact together as if it was all true. Now, can you imagine what that does to your self-image? It, it corrupts it. It diminishes it. And you walk around with this idea, and I'm only giving you one idea of many thousands of ideas uh, that happen in our experience. And you can bring that idea forward to your present day living. See, the me story contributes to low self-acceptance, which if it's low self-acceptance, we're very high in self-criticism and self-judging. And I don't, I've never met an addict yet that wasn't highly critical of themselves, highly critical. You know, it's as if we come from the addiction and we begin to see the harm that we've caused and we take on the bigger burden uh, that really is exaggerated in a sense. Because there's nothing we can do about our past. There's only restoration that can happen. Uh, but however, this, this idea of bringing this stuff forward diminishes me as a human being. And as I continue that line of thinking, my motivation and energy gets reduced. Now, maximizing strength is another set in the wheel. To be focused and positioning yourself on what you do well and to do it more often. What that does is gives us energy and expands who we are, and we get to live life being more and experiencing and expressing and manifesting our strengths. This is a fast road to well being, mindfulness. You know, every one of us, uh, we recognize that. Our attention span is very narrow. It's been estimated about eight seconds. And our mindfulness is, is that way because we haven't been trained. We, what occurs to us is that we have an experience and immediately we judge yourself or judge this experience immediately before really understanding what that experience represents. Now, the problem with that is that judging takes us out of the experience and, and then it puts us in our thoughts. So it's like, it's, give me a metaphor. It's like walking into a court of law. If you ever had the opportunity to live, walk into a court of law and you have this all beautiful wooden room, nicely lit, you have this big design behind the judge of, a, of a, uh, an emblem or something like that, very stoic. It's almost royalty. You walk in the room, there's a, there's a, uh, court reporter there, someone who's organizing the court, there's a, there's a prosecutor, there's a defendant. And you walk in and the, the bailiff calls to order the court. The court is now in session, he would say. And the judge immediately hands down the sentence to the party that's been accused. You would think that would be crazy, wouldn't you? What kind of kangaroo court is this? That's what we do. We put the verdict in before we begin to understand what our experience actually represents to us. So in mindfulness, we learn how to defer our judgment and to allow and to notice the experience. And what occurs is that we begin to see things we never saw before. But I can give you all kinds of examples of that. This is the way to live. What interferes with that is our impulsiveness. This need to do something immediately. This idea of avoiding something that may be painful. And we move away from it, thinking that we dealt with it. But really what's happened is emotionally, we've suppressed it. 
Now, when suppressing emotions, it happens this way, they're going to rise up at some point because they're sitting rotting in a dark corner of our souls. And they're not going to sit there forever. They're not healing. They're getting worse. So in mindfulness, what we're doing here is we're becoming what is called open aware of experiences that we're having, and we're less likely to be drawn back into our thinking. You see, overthinking only offers emotional imbalance. So if you're in your head a lot, ruminating and trying to figure everything out, what's going to be occurring is negative thinking and, and feeling called, this is a, called a cycle called thought feeling cycle. And you're just kind of rotating between thoughts and feelings, rotating thoughts and feelings. And the only way to get off this cycle is to step in a mindful standpoint where you become a, a, what I would call a sacred observer. You begin to watch and notice the cycle happening. And now what can happen, you can make better choices for yourself because you're not caught in uh, the, the, the storm of the emotion or the thought. Next is the coping and resiliency. See, what I teach and what I share with people, it's not about getting rid of the defects of character. Now, I want you to hear what I'm saying exactly. I don't want you to put and connect something else to it. I am still responsible for my defects of character, but I am not trying to get rid of them. I've learned to accept them. Because can you imagine uh, that you would be the only person that have defects of character? Of course not. Every human being on earth that has lived or is living all have weaknesses. So by me wishing that I can get rid of my weaknesses would be so unusual and so counter to the human experience. It's a waste of time. When you pay attention and try to fight these weaknesses, you make them stronger. They become bigger because we're engaging with them. And there's an old expression, I'm sure all of you know, what we resist persists. What I, we learn to deal with, and what I we can learn to deal with is coping and resiliencies, coping mechanisms. The way to work with those things so that we can have a reasonable outcome. They're tools. They're tools from the tool shed that we can pull out and prune whatever needs to be pruned, cut whatever needs to be cut, for that we can continue to move on with our defects of character. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about goals and motivation. I'm just going to leave that. we we'll talk about the meaning and value of living. When we find purpose, we find passion, when we find our reason for being, we become motivated intrinsically. In other words, we're not motivated by some external force. We're motivated within. We want to do better. We want to be better. And we have the excitement and the enthusiasm as God is causing us to move forward because we have found meaning in our life. And of course, you can't imagine having uh, emotional sobriety and be involved in a negative relationship. It just doesn't work. You can't walk away being angry or uh, uh, jealous or resentful and claim emotional sobriety. It, 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 is, it is inconsistent with what emotional sobriety represents. So these are practices uh, which I have developed and honed over time to deliver to the world of addicts to let them know that there's evidence-based skill sets that they can have through some practices. And one of those things we're gonna talk about today is about setting goals and motivation. So I am just going to share a slide set with you. And let me know if you can see it. Can you see that? Yeah, you see the slide set? I think it's the same um, yeah. screen you've been on, John, yeah. So I put this, this slide up a little bit of tongue in cheek because these things seem unrelated. You know, what does it mean, John? Because what is the correlation 
that emotional sobriety in establishing goals of motivation that we said, how did that even come together? One might not think that it comes together. And I hope by this little bit of uh, slide work we're going to do together today, you may be able to see some of the thinking. So, uh, so wait a minute. What about a day at a time? You know, <laughs> isn't goal setting all about the future and flies in the face a day at a time? And see how sometimes we can collapse ideas where planning and living are two different things. When we're planning goals, we are planning out in the future, but we're not living in the plan of the future. So in other words, what I'm saying to you, if you had a goal of losing 10 pounds and all you saw was yourself living in the future of 10 pounds, that becomes a problem because you're not living in the moment. But if you were, had a goal of losing 10 pounds as a possible outcome, not a rigid outcome, but a possible outcome, you then may have a series of steps to get there. And what you'll discover is that you could be living in the now, practicing a particular step to reach for you to reach that goal of yours of losing 10 pounds. So both things can be operating together, living a day at a time, and also planning, goal setting, moving forward somewhere in your life. Yeah, so can I do both? Living in a day at a time, pursuing goals? Absolutely. We all do it. Which one of us haven't thought about, if you're early in sobriety, haven't thought, oh, I would really like to get my one year in, or three months in, or one month in? You know, we're always we're going on vacation. We just don't hit the road. We do some planning. So this idea that we shouldn't be goal setting is really incomplete and not correct. You know, also a myth here that goal setting doesn't work for me. So why should I bother? I've tried it so many times. I you know I kind of given up on this. And there's a sufficient evidence for people have an inherent desire to grow. In other words, it's in our nature as a human being to grow and to prosper, to seek competency. And these are backed up by all kinds of study, including Maslow's and DC determination theory, neurological studies of the brain plasticity. All of this is, is evidence-based that says to each of us that we have the capacity to grow if we choose to grow, if we choose to move ahead in a particular direction. We have the capability of doing that. If we decide we will capitalize on our desire to grow, so what's next? Isn't it setting a direction? So say you want to be more spiritual as an example. You just say that as a simple request. I want to be more spiritual. Well, you just don't leave it there, would you? I mean, that's like hanging on a cliff. You, what does it mean to be more spiritual? Well, you know what? I want to be able to meditate more. Oh, now we're planning a goal. I want to be more prayerful. Okay, what resources are we going to have? How are you going to do it? What books are you going to read? Who are you going to share this experience with? We would ask ourselves naturally a whole series of questions to lay down a path for us, give us a direction for the outcome of being more spiritual. So if no direction is set, we become like a boat with a rudder, without a, without a rudder going in circles. I mean, that's what we would do. And we kind of bounce back and forth with different things. And there's really no direction in our life. And although we want these things uh, globally, if we don't set a direction, we're going to be all over the map. We're going to get lost. And that's just a fact of life. That's the way it is. We need to learn to set direction. Yeah, John, you still haven't answered the question of the connection between goal setting and emotional sobriety. Okay, let me see if I can. Goals are align ourselves with the need to grow. 
you see? They connect us with our values. We then start moving in a particular direction. So goals don't work. You know, proof is that every January the 1st, I set goals, and by January the 5th, I failed. I come to this conclusion, I'm not disciplined enough. That's a myth. I'm a great starter, but a poor finisher. That's a story. It's a myth. I just can't seem to get across the finish line. It's a myth. It's a story that we tell ourselves. And I'm going to tell you what happens, friends. In the absence of knowing how to do something, we blame ourselves. Let me repeat that. Because this is important for your emotional well-being. In the absence of not knowing how to do something, and if we fail, we blame ourselves. And all that is there is that we didn't know how to do it. There's nothing to blaming ourselves for. We just didn't know. So when we put a goal in front of us and we failed, it is not something personal. It is something that's missing in our structure and planning and goal setting. So goals, what are they? We can define them as a mental blueprint of desired future scenarios. It's a blueprint. It's a map. What's the impact? There's a direct boost in subjective well-being. When we're working or approaching something, our well-being increases. Ah, there's the connection for emotional sobriety. If I'm feeling good about myself, guess what happened? I'm producing a lot of wonderful positive emotions. Uh, I'm not producing the angst and the conflicts and the, and the upsets and the frustrations and the stress. What I'm producing now as a subjective well-being. So now we're getting closer to the connection of goals and emotional sobriety. It's supercharge. We energize, focus, amplifying motivation, and enhance our learning. Now, it doesn't really matter the size of the goal. In other words, it's better to have a really small goal that is short-term and for us to walk that path and feel the success of it. Now, I'll give you an example. Say I wanted to do more walking or go to the gym to exercise, and I'm not used to exercising. But yet I know it's good for my health, and I really think I need to do it in order for us to stay healthy. So, But somehow or another, I make excuses not to go to the gym. It just seems like too large of a jump for me. So what I could do is this. I could... Put my running shoes beside my chair one day. And there's my running shoes beside my chair. That's all I have, would have to do. And I could say, good for you, John. You, you put your running shoes beside your chair. Well, maybe next day I'll put my running shoes on. And I could say to myself, good for you, John, for putting your running shoes on. And I'm starting to feel that I'm progressing. You know what I mean? You know what it feels like when you're progressing in something? You feel good. You feel motivated. You feel like you want to do more. It's when we're being pushed down, where we fail so often, we, we stop. We get out of that game. But we could turn that upside down. And maybe the next day, I'll wear my running shoes and drive by the gym. Not to win it. Then maybe the next day I would drive by the gym, stop and go into the gym and have a drink of water and leave. Now, I know I'm making this point, you know, it, but each time I'm successful, I'm getting more and more motivated. And then I'm finally, what I'll find myself doing almost normally and naturally is to go to the gym and be, do the exercise. Small, small steps makes a difference in a person's life. Proximity is a, is a feature of a goal. It's a short-term goals, immediate, actionable steps. The benefit is to boost persistence and foster self-confidence. Now, what has that got to do with emotional sobriety? Oh, anytime we feel we're fostering self-confidence and we're boosting our persistence as a strength, we feel good about ourselves. 
And when we feel good about ourselves, we have this emotional regulation. Long-term goals tagline is visionary, future-oriented aims. Strategy is to combine with short terms to enhance our performance. So depending on the goal that you want to set, you want to separate them into short-term and long-term goals. And we want to be very careful to use our ability, our rational ability, at the success of it. Now, what interferes with that? Well, it's all or nothing thinking. It's our cognitive distortion. The main problem of an alcoholic centers in his mind. Either I got to go to the gym and work out for four hours, or I'm not going to do it at all. You see the thinking? Well, that distortion prevents us from getting into action. So we always have to be careful about all or nothing thinking, dualistic thinking, black and white thinking. There's more gray than black and white. So it's action oriented. Approach goals, move towards something. Positive outcomes result in elevated well being and academic performance. Now, I, maybe we don't go to school here anymore, but we still perform academically. We want to learn how to deal with life on life's terms. That is an academic performance. We, we want to be there, paying attention, learning from our experiences. And oddly enough, uh, when we approach a goal, those are the positive outcomes. We have elevated well being once again. What has that got to do with the emotional regulation or emotional sobriety? It has a lot to do with it. Now, here's something that's fascinating, and that is avoidance of goals to move away from undesirable outcomes. Warning, it is linked to negative consequences. Now, how does this play out in the 12 step rooms? Well, I want to be less angry. So I'm moving away from anger. Now, what I didn't know for so many years as I was trying to work on my anger was I was actually creating negative consequences according to the studies that have been done in this area. I was actually, with good intent, trying to do something positive in my life, but because of my ignorance, what I was doing was draining my energy and uh, having more negative uh, consequences in my life because the way I was approaching it. So what could be done about anger? Well, I'm gonna go and move towards being patient, being tolerant, being kind. I'm gonna practice those skill sets. You'll get the better outcome rather than avoiding something. So what's purpose? Learning goals, mastery, the aim is to develop skills or knowledge, edge that boost intrinsic motivation and optimum performance. Isn't that what we do as we come to these meetings? We have a learning goal, we masters in, in our life to really live life well, to be a free expressing person, to not to have these conditions that stop us or contain us or slow us down that we get to learn how to deal with things like fear, anxiety, and stress, upset, and frustration, dishonesty, and all these other things that occur in a human being. This is what we're doing here. We're learning. We're trying to learn how to deal with life on life's terms. But there's performance goals as well. The aim is to validate personal abilities, motivating yet can be deterred performance under pressure. So this idea of duality, we've got to be careful of it. We've got to how we measure our outcomes is important. So instead of measuring the outcome, we can measure our progress. Isn't that what we do when we talk about living a day at a time? We're talking about actually experiencing life in this, this 24 hours, and more specifically in this meeting. We're talking about being aware and being mindful so that we can experience something new. Meanwhile, what, what we're moving towards is a particular outcome of being whole or being restored. We're not focused on being restored. What we're focused on is right here and now, the progress in which we're making. And for us to delight in the progress we're making, I noticed an observation 
of, uh, of addicts that we tend to be drawn to the very negative. And uh, uh, I don't think that's unusual. There's something about drama that appeals to us. And what we miss in that paying attention to that side of our lives is that we miss the delight, the accomplishment, the progress that we're making. And we, it kind of disappears on us. And we could conclude we're not very good at something. For instance, uh, I have made a practice to review what I've done and to celebrate each of the things that I have done. And then I reviewed the things I haven't done. I used to do, what I used to do was just look at the things I didn't finish. And it always made me feel poorly. Now, if I feel poorly, how does that relate to emotional sobriety? Well, it disturbs it, doesn't it? It diminishes it. You see, emotional sobriety is not just getting through hard times, difficult times, although that's part of it. Emotional sobriety is something that we can live fully and completely every day, that we just know how to deal with life on life's terms, that we have a system in place that we can have optimal performance to flourish as a human being. This is what we're after, isn't it? This is our goal. These goals have got to be specific. Specific goals need to be defined in end states like losing five pounds. But you have to be careful of this. This, this oftentimes when we go on a diet to lose weight, our measurement is the weight that we lose. And guess what? I've learned that that is out of my control. The body does funny things. You know, you could do the math. The math is that 3,600 calories is, uh, is a pound. And that if, uh, if I have 3,500 calories to burn every day, and if I, lose, if I only eat 2,000 calories, that means every three days I should lose a pound mathematically. But it doesn't work that way. The body resists it, holds on to things at times. And I look at it and I said, geez, I've only eaten this much and I haven't lost any weight. Oh, what the hell? I'm not going to do this anymore. See, we want to be able to control the things that we set out to do. And what can I control? Well, I, what I can control is I can eat 2,000 calories a day and let the body do whatever it does. See, I can control that. That is in my realm of control. So be careful when you're looking at specificity, make sure the outcome is in your control and it's not out of your control. Non-specific goals, uh, like lose weight, is easy to adopt, but it have varying results as potentially worse performance. There's something about specificity there that's very important that catches the human, the eye of the human being. We want to be very specific about the goal, but also we want to be able to accept failure if we don't reach it. So what's the hierarchy? You visualize goals as trees, sub goals as branches, the benefits, the simplify, break complex tasks down into manageable parts. Uh, I just don't say I want to get in shape. I want to break that down. What does that really represent? Uh, I want to feel better about myself. Okay, wonderful. What does that really represent? Let's break it down to the sub goals. It may include getting proper rest, eating properly, doing some exercise, and reading some spiritual things. So we want to get down into the weeds. We want to go deep so that we know what to do. And to monitor our progress seamlessly. See, this is what happens. We get lost where our focus goes away. We're not as mindful as what we think we are. And once we stop monitoring our progress, what occurs is that we lose the motivation to continue, to monitor our progress, whatever it is. I could show you what I do in terms of my, my health stuff, uh, but uh, I, met, I monitor every day. Every day I look at the numbers and see if I'm uh, doing better or staying the same or getting worse. Uh, and then I make corrective actions in order to improve the results that I'm getting. Q and A session. How can I cope with the emotional pain? 
and isolation caused by my sister cutting me out of the family after our father's death. And what you're sharing uh, is the resistance to the pain. This is normal, by the way. There's nothing wrong with you doing that. This is how uh, many of us, including myself, have grown to to uh, process what I we believe is uh, avoiding a painful uh, heart. In other words, we want to get away from it. And by trying to, trying to go away from it, what we're creating is making it worse. So this, this may sound very too simple, uh, but there's a, there's a place of acceptance in that, and acceptance in your pain and your longing for the loss of your family, including your father. Uh, I know it's not ideal. Uh, I'm sure you would like it some other way. Um, but if you were to accept the conditions in which you are now facing, realizing you're going to feel painful and be okay with it in a sense that you can do whatever you wish to do, like going walking while you're feeling painful. In other words, it's not something that's going to prevent you from doing it. See, this is the way to emotional sobriety, is not having circumstances perfect or doing well for you or things going your way. It's when things that are not going your way, we can still have the sense of uh, emotional regulation. And uh, these two quick suggestions I gave to you, you might be thinking, well, I don't want to do that, or that's not true, or I, I want to I want to be uh, what I'm being in a moment and shut down. What I can say to you, though, man, is that it's, it's where you find yourself is not unusual. And the practice is to be with the pain rather than trying to avoid it or run away with it or try to get rid of it. Because the only way we're, 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 the only way we're doing that is suppressing it. And it's going to make worse. I don't know. That, I hope that helps you relieve some of the anger or the upset that you have. How do I deal with someone who deliberately annoys me for their amusement, causing emotional exhaustion while keeping my composure? I'm assuming here, and it's a big assumption, is that you're not able to break free of that person that you're, you're, you're either agreed to or you're forced to live in the same quarters. So you're learning to deal with somebody who's objectionable who may tease you, uh, it may hurt you, as you might be. Am I getting this right? Okay. So what, what, what can you do? Well, I, I'm going to tell you what happens. The people will continue the behavior if they know that they're getting to you. <laughs> Matter of fact, it is used as a motivator because if their purpose is to bug you or to irritate you, you're allowing your, them to show that that's actually happening. So you're actually providing them fodder to continue the behavior. Now, you cannot control the behavior. You gotta be very clear about this to yourself. And it is your responsibility how you react to the behavior. In other words, you have it that it annoys you. Is there another way that you can perceive that from a point? In other words, can you change your perspective on it? Like with somebody, you know, I'll give you an example of what I'm trying to say to you. Uh, someone used to say to me, oh, I don't like you. I don't like your opinions. Uh, I would react to that. I would react to being angry or upset. Uh, and I, I'd want to either fight or flee. Uh, I don't do that anymore. Uh, I say something like this. Boy, when you really get to know me, you can find out what's worse I am as a human being than you think I am already. I make a joke about it. Uh, so I changed my perspective and when I was being what I thought was being attacked, which works marvelously because what happens is people stop attacking me because they knew they couldn't get to me. Same thing here. Uh, you know what? Imagine... Well, I don't know what's going on. I don't know the details here. So I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm throwing a lot of darts out here. But imagine you say to that person who's bugging you, say, thank you for that. You remind me of how, uh, how 
good I am around people. Thank you for that. Now that may sound strange and it may sound counterintuitive, but when the person starts to hear that message, that they're actually contributing to your well-being, maybe they're less likely to do it again. And all you've done is change the, your perspective. You also have to appreciate they can't make you feel poorly about yourself. That's just, that. That's on you. You you've been triggered uh, to react to a set of circumstances over time, as we all have. But it doesn't have to be that way. We can find a new occurring, a new perspective on how to deal with people that are awkward or, or contrary or whatever way you want to express that person. So consider that. Acceptance of, a, of the person, knowing that you can't change them. Don't give them the outcome that they're looking for. Uh, and change your perspective and thank the person because it reminds you of how wonderful of a person you actually are. How do I handle my daughter's toxic relationship where a man financially supports her, hindering her recovery and causing me distress? You know, how does one react to those kinds of conditions? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I think one thing I could maybe say is that what's required of somebody early in sobriety is that they are going to make mistakes and make decisions for themselves that they think is worthwhile. Turns out that it's not to be manipulated or by someone who's uh, more, I don't know, manipulative, I guess. But what do we do with it as a result of uh, I, I think uh, the question becomes, what, what can we learn from this experience? What is there to learn? You take the morality out of it, the anger out of it, the, I'm sure, resentment out of that scenario, because that's not healthy for anyone of us who are in sobriety. And you try to learn from the experience. Uh, that's the best you can do at the moment, because that experience has already happened. You can't change it. And... Uh, the more anger or feeling sorry for oneself being put in that position is, a, is understandable, but does it work? And the answer to that is no. So the big question here, what can, what can be learned about it, both from the, the young lady and maybe from the mother as well? What, what can be learned from that? And to keep it in that perspective where they could take this experience, as terrible as it sounds, uh, and to advance themselves in sobriety. I, 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 you know, I don't know what else to say about that. I'm just so sorry to hear that. How can I stop beating myself up for not knowing how to do something and failing to ask for help? Yeah, it, it, what you said is exactly true. You, you know, we, we take one situation and, okay, so we, we, we failed at something, we beat ourselves up. Now, the next step is we beat ourselves up further because we beat ourselves up. And we compound it over and over again until we diminish who we are. And I have this expression I use often, Woody, and that's the sacred identity, is getting touch with this idea that we are, we are somebody that is, is in restoration. We're being restored. Now, that's a journey. It is a journey. Uh, you and I are self-critical based on a long history of using that pattern. And the let's look at the intention of the, the pattern. The intention is to motivate us to do better. That's why we're critical of ourselves. We, we, you know, we want to do better. Well, we use that terrible word, should do better, or know better, or ought to. Uh, or always or never. And there's a whole bunch of universal language that we, that's poured into this situation. And what happens, it makes us feel worse. Now, that's an illusion. It's an illusion. It isn't real. It is the conversation we're having with self that is making us feel diminished. Now, what do you do about it? Well, that is not a simple answer to answer to. You. Like, this, for instance, the self acceptance masterclass I runs nine weeks long. It's because it's nine weeks long is because there's all kinds of tributaries that contribute to the lack of self-acceptance that need to be looked at and measured. 
And this is why it's so important to me to continue the work I'm doing in evidence-based patterns, uh, because it is, you cannot have self-acceptance or suspend our personal judgment without some skill sets and understand what's really going on here. And it's not as simple as, as, as say, oh, just, just, just accept yourself as you are. Just, well, no, it's more, there's more stuff going on underneath. So what can I do? What can I offer you? One thing I can offer you. And that is the self-criticism. Its consequence is making yourself feel worse. It has no value for you to move forward. Practice suspending the judgment, the self-criticism for a short period of time and to see what's available to you in a non-judgmental way. So uh, let me give it a I'm trying to think of an example. Um, if I were, again, if I wanted to lose weight and I find I overate, I would judge myself critically because I went against the values in which I was intended. And if I stay on that course, I will not have any motivation to lose weight. I would say, out of hell with it. Versus, okay, I overate. I'm going to suspend my judgment and I'm going to see what's missing a growth mindset. I'm learning from my experience. Now I can, I can look at different resources that I have that will help me, uh, uh, help me move forward. So if you're being self-critical and self-judging, it's good that you recognize it, that's insight. So you're becoming aware, but just say to yourself and talk to the judging uh, as if it were a person saying, you know what, just sit over there for a moment. I want to evaluate this without your judgment and to see what's available to you to move forward. And I think what you'll find that little step will make a significant difference in your life. Yeah. So when we're involved in the storm of self-judgment and self-criticism, our creativity shuts down because we're in the storm. We're trying to survive. So if we if we could just step out of this storm, and that's suspending judgment, we step out of it and look around to see what's available and ask myself this question, what's missing here? Not what's wrong with me. The wrong question. What is missing here? How can I better understand my son's struggles with self-doubt, anxiety, and addiction? and find the right way to support him, especially when I feel helpless. Well, I think the greatest, and I, I have a daughter who's a, a, an addict, and I'll tell you, I, I wish I could behave better in moments of that experience. Uh, but what, I, what I've learned was that she already knows what to do. Uh, so by me telling her what to do or what she should be doing, what to be avoiding, she just turns me out. What I works better is that if I I appreciate or understand their position, uh, or I get it, tell me more about that. I, I just to let them know that they're connecting with you or with me at the level at which they're able to connect. And that might be thinking that you might consider incorrect or improper or wrong or however we would judge that. But there's something magical happens when we can suspend that and lead with, I want to understand. I'm curious. How is it for you? And I, I'm in the coaching business and uh, I try to slay the advice monster. That's my first order of business uh, because I want to bring people to a place where they figure it out for themselves. So I ask a lot of open-ended questions in the circumstances while trying to understand their position. And it comes down to this. What is it you want to do about this? And it may mean nothing, by the way. I don't want to do anything about it right now. Okay, I understand. Good. And give them the responsibility of making the choices that they have for their lives. Because my daughter is 43, by the way, and your son is 30. Are, are, are adults, they're adults, even though they're still thinking as your children. Uh, so I, 
I've allowed my daughter to make those choices for herself, although I have to tell you, it pains me ah, terribly to experience what I've experienced with her. And I don't think it's some sort of payback for what I did to my parents or anything like that, but I'll tell you, it, it puts you to the test. So I admire you for you know, being so uh, willing to share that with us because it uh, certainly touched my heart. Thank you. How can I manage body shaking during communication and boundary setting when my words aren't respected? One of the words that it stands out to me in trying to control. Well, we think by exerting control will make the thing better. We're concerned about being freewheeling and open because we don't know where that will take us. So we try to control that in a conversation. And what happens is that when we're, when we're trying to control something, it actually has a worse outcome because we can't control it. You're feeling what you're feeling. You're not being authentic in what you're feeling. And if it happens to go loud, it happens to go loud because maybe it's important and passionate for you. Now, that's the first thing. The next thing that stuck out in my mind when you were talking about I was forced to, you're not forced to anything. You've, you've made some sort of agreement to do that. And what I would ask you to consider is that your, your world is, is something like, what are these people doing to me? Uh, uh, there's, there's something there that you may want to look at. Because I want you to get, uh, we're not, no one's forced to do anything. We accepted or we agreed to, or some part of it anyway. And that's very freeing to come to realize that because now you're in the middle of a choice. You're not being forced to anything. So I would suggest that when you're communicating that, I, I love the word that you're trying to communicate your body sensations are doing one thing, and I think you're trying to say something else. Listen to your body. You know, your body, is. this is what's so beautiful about our bodies. Our head spins the truth. That's what, the, that's what our brain does. It spins the truth. It doesn't care about truth, actually. It, thoughts are not reality. Uh, it, we'll think the craziest thoughts. The body is, does have no way of separating that. The body responds naturally the way the body responds. And we can learn a great deal about how our body is, is responding. It's okay to have those experiences in your body when you're confronted with some sort of conflict and how to deal and make resolution with it. So uh, I don't know what you're doing in terms of, uh, in terms of working through the resolution uh, to your challenge uh, through through communication, but this is what I can suggest to you, the nonviolent communication structure, that first of all, you, you observe the conversation. That's the first, you observe it. You're not in it, you're not battling it, you're not defending, you're just observing. Next thing you wanna do is tell the person what you need and how you feel about the situation. Not that they should do something, but how you feel in need. And then lastly, which really works well, is to make a request for a change. A request, not a command, not a demand, not take it or leave it kinds of approaches, but make a request. Most people respond favorably to that style of communication. And meanwhile, be okay with your emotional upset. Why? Because you're emotionally upset. You see, emotional sobriety is recognizing and being with the moments that we are upset. It's not that we should be some other way. No, it isn't. We need to respond naturally to how we're actually experiencing. What I, what I do is that I honor every experience I have, even though some thoughts I have are correct, and I know they're not correct. They're just thoughts, though. But I honor the thought. Oh, I know who you are. You know, maybe I instantly don't like somebody for some reason for no reason, actually. I acknowledge the fact, okay, that's just a thought. Uh, and I don't embrace it. I don't look for evidence for it. I just allow it to come and go. So start to be truer to yourself in a sense of honoring your experience 
rather than trying to be some other way. I don't know if this is helpful or not because I feel like I, there's, there's so much limited information I have. I'm just throwing darts at a, in a dark room, <laughs> but I don't want to lead you astray either. What's important here is how you operate in that situation, not what other people do. How do I manage displaced anger from my mother's passing and address it effectively? You know what, first of all, I'm sorry to hear about your mother, Amy, and a loss is, is a loss, even, even if it's a, a loss of a relationship that you're angry at. Grief is real, and grief will tend to exaggerate our anger, upset, and so on, or bring to the surface what's lying fallow. The, the acute hurt of grief brings this stuff forward. And I'd like to say to you that uh, I would certainly not interfere with the counseling you're getting involved, but I would say to you, first of all, you can accept your anger as being normal. And just to recognize that is beautiful because uh, you again can, when it's expressed in a place that it shouldn't be expressed, you can always apologize for the offer. Be okay with your anger. It it will it'll come back. Uh, you're 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 normalizing your your emotions will come return when the feelings of, of exaggerated feelings start to relax. And this takes time, by the way. Unresolved issues. It's funny, you know. You may not even thought of it, and when your mother was alive, but well, these unresolved issues get brought up. When, when things change for us, and be okay with that. Be okay with yourself and feeling what you're feeling. Honor those feelings. And if, uh, you have already done this, by the way, which I think is incredible, is that you recognize the anger is misplaced. Beautiful, and that's insightful, that's great. And if you find yourself doing it, just be ready to apologize and make it right. Allow yourself the room and the freedom to be able to express what you've been suppressing.